Well, everybody say praise the Lord. I still believe that that is fitting tonight. Amen. That we would take and we would acknowledge that we're right here in the house of God. Amen. No matter what we're doing, amen, here in the house this evening, it's about the kingdom. It's about strengthening the kingdom. It's about growing our knowledge of our history, where we come from, and not only where we've come from, but where we're going. Because I believe that the past informs the present as well as informs our future. So it indeed is a great honor for me to be here. And I want to say thank you to my dear friend, Pastor Young, amen, for that gracious introduction tonight. I I almost didn't recognize who was going to be speaking this evening, but uh, I want to say thank you to him for that, amen, to this church. We love and appreciate you. We always want to take and talk about your pursuit of excellence and then to one that I call my dear friend, mentor, amen, and bishop, I want to say thank you, Dr. Wilson. We love and appreciate you because really he's the one that set us out on this journey. And uh, so we want to say thank you to him. And then I see, uh, I just call him Bishop Young. I love him so very much. It means so much to me, him and his wife as well. So, and then see my friend walk in. Amen. Now, now I'm under pressure now. Now that I see uh, Brother Parks walk in, Brother Phillips, may the Lord richly, richly bless you. All of the ministry that is here, we indeed salute you for Christ's sake. Now, this evening, we're going to try to do something a little bit different. I I, I did take and I brought digital notes and I brought paper notes. Now, that may mean nothing to any of those that may be watching, uh, viewing this on uh, the web uh, stream, but I want you to know I've spoken in this church before and we have lost power. And so I brought double sets of notes tonight. And uh, at that time, I had to use my my iPad. So tonight, we're going to start with the iPad, and we'll see if we can uh, get through all of this that way. Amen. So again, I want to say thank you so very much. I recognize that we're taking and we are in a different environment this evening. I would like and take to take just for a moment, and I know that we're sitting in the Rock Church, but I'd like to call this Wilson University Grand Lecture Hall. Because this evening, I'm not donning my hat as a preacher. I'm coming to you right now as a professor. And uh, so we're going to bring you knowledge that possibly you have never heard presented in this fashion. Maybe you've never heard the information that I'm going to bring to you tonight. Or maybe you've read little bits and pieces along the way. Or maybe someone has also or potentially shared with you uh, some of the information that you're going to hear tonight. However, I believe that the knowledge that we're going to impart to you this evening is groundbreaking. And so I believe it's only fitting this evening that I bring you up to speed on exactly how that we came to this point and the reason why that this research was ever even conducted. I'm going to walk you through church history in the medieval era and the 16th century. And you might ask, how did an apostolic pastor, an interculturalist, and missiologist become involved in scholarly research of the Reformation? Well, the genesis of of the project was quite unexpected. An acquaintance of mine who is a tenured UC professor of history was contacted by Dr. Edward Smyther. He is the dean of Columbia University, as well as Dr. Robert Gallagher. Department. Uh, he is the dean of the Department of Intercultural Studies at Wheaton Graduate School. And they asked her, do you know of any missiologist or historian who might be able to speak at the Evangelical Missiological Society's World Conference in Dallas, Texas in 2018? The topic, mission in the 16th century. Admittedly, let me tell you that the 16th century was way out of my scope of interest at that point in time. I, of course, had read Fox's Book of Martyrs. I had read uh, The Martyr's Mirror, but I had done nothing more as far as research in the 16th century. Your pastor and I have studied together at Fuller Theological Seminary, and we studied mission together, but even in our mission courses, uh, these, these centuries were just glazed over and we didn't really take time to talk about them. And so they asked me to take and present or whoever they were going to ask to present on the 16th mission in the 16th century. 
What's ironic is that the overarching theme was a celebration of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Now that's really strange. You have asked an apostolic pastor and missiologist to talk to you about mission in the 16th century. And I'm going to present to you tonight and tell you uh, that we were the ones that were persecuted in the 16th century. And yet they've invited me to their meeting uh, to present about, and here is my title, Baptism, Glossolalia, and Persecution in the 16th and early 17th century. Or as we've begun to rework the, re the research now, we've included Pentecostal impulse and characteristics uh, in the 16th and 17th century. You need to understand uh, that the church is not something that came out uh, of a restorationist movement. We did not come out of the time of piety. Uh, we came, our roots came out of Acts chapter number 2, verse number 37 through 42. We need to take and indeed celebrate who we are. And so this evening I turn your attention back 500 years years. Along the way this evening, we'll be discussing things that will date from potentially the 14th, the 15th, the 16th, 17th, 18th century, and we'll also continuously go back to Acts chapter number two and discuss the first century, second, third, and even fourth century church. The story of the Reformation is filled with beauty and betrayal, intrigue, and injustice. Admittedly, it is difficult to understand the mind, the heart, and the actions of those living through the ecclesial tumult uh, of the 16th century, let alone judge them. With this in mind, the study examines baptism and persecution as catalysts for mission in the 16th and early 17th centuries. The groups and individuals whose histories are chronicled uh, in the following pages did not always perceive their actions as intentional mission. And may I digress for just a moment, and you may ask the question, what groups might you, speak in, uh, might you be speaking of? Uh, well, I'm talking about the Cathars, the Albigensians, the Dauntonists, the Commissards, the Waldensians, the Moravians, the Lollers, the Sibelians, uh, the Rakovians, uh, the Schwenkfelders, uh, the Enthusiasts, the Inspirationists, and the Rationalists, to only name a few. All of these uh, were groups that were marginalized uh, by the Roman church and the subsequent emerging magisterial church. Uh, and so these groups did not always perceive their actions as intentional mission. Mission, or the outspreading of the gospel, was frequently the result of religious persecutions by the Roman church or Catholics, Lutherans, uh, and the Reformed church. Anabaptists, as these other groups that I've made mention of, suffered cruel persecution in their pursuit of the earliest form of Christianity as practiced by the primitive church. I want you to get that again. Uh, these were willing to suffer persecution in their pursuit of the earliest form of Christianity in the, 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 in the primitive church, or we interchangeably will use the word this evening, the early church. Uh, these desired more than a reformation. They sought restoration. Persecution of these various groups and individuals uh, were the result of a resolve for nothing less than the original form of Christianity. As explicated... Their words, not mine, as explicated in Acts chapter number 2, verse number 37 uh, through verse number 47. Restoration encompassing theology, liturgy, church government, 
and lifestyle. Uh, these wanted the whole package. They wanted everything to be restored that the church had once practiced. That should excite us this evening as apostolics. Uh, notable among the beliefs and practices of these were water baptism upon repentance and to a lesser degree, the phenomenon of glossolalia or speaking in other tongues. Persecution of these pious folk is reminiscent uh, to that experienced in the early church. As persecution comes, uh, diaspora results and Christ is magnified throughout the nations. As the early church, the Anabaptists and these other groups saw themselves living again the painful persecution of the apostolic church hounded by cruel political and religious lords who had no mercy for the defenseless, the sick, and the helpless. Church history must be considered from multiple perspectives, past, present, and future. This chapter or this lecture tonight explores the missional understanding and impulse of the early Anabaptist and other, in quotes, radical reformers. For these, the missional mandate as elucidated in the scripture and forced migration due to persecution were extricably linked. Uh, discussion of persecution related to the Reformation remain unpleasant topics after 500 years. Admittedly, these are topics that are colored by perspective and opinion and history. It is important for any serious student to, to consider how one's perspective shapes the narrative. It has been said the past is a foreign country. The challenge is, can we imagine the past from our vantage point in history? Or can we see it from where we stand and understand what was going on in those particular times? Our vantage point of the reform mission, its understanding and practice is more likely than not tied to our religious traditions and beliefs. Faulty or not, our traditions and beliefs are the basis from which we draw opinions and conclusions. However, beyond the frame of reference and opinion lies the historical account, the historical account of beliefs and practices of the early church and subsequent generations is open for all to review and consider. I'll stop and interject here, rereading that last line again. The historical account of the beliefs and practices of the early church and subsequent generations is open for all to review and consider. We must go back to the primary sources uh, to find what these people really believed. Uh, the problem that we have allowed as a scholarly community or neglected as a scholarly community is we have allowed, and we'll deal with it later on, we have allowed the victors to shape the narrative. Uh, they are the ones that have written the history, and as a result, they've written us out. They've marginalized us. They've called us radicals. Uh, they have defined who we are in the annals of history. Can I just get excited as an apostolic and say, I am no no longer going to step by and allow them to be the ones who define who we are. We are the people of God. Uh, amen. And while they may have burned uh, our books, uh, they may have burned our writings, uh, they may have persecuted us to the death, uh, there is enough still there in the primary sources to authenticate uh, that the Acts 238 message uh, is still alive and was alive then. Finally, this lecture seeks to answer, did the Anabaptist practice of itinerant preaching make them more missional than their counterparts? You'll find some questions that I seek 
to answer in this research. Uh, how did the 16th century reforming church understand and practice mission? What did mission look like and how did it change in the century of the Protestant Reformation? Did Catholics such as the Jesuits, a product of the Catholic Reformation, get mission by continuing to go into the entire world and preach the gospel. Also, since Luther and Calvin's ministries focused largely on continental Europe, did they lack a biblical understanding of mission? And since I'm in a friendly setting tonight, I'll say immediately, yes. Alternatively, did 16th century conflicts on the European soil make it structurally impossible for Protestants to move beyond Europe's borders with the gospel? No, it didn't. The Jesuits were. Did the Anabaptist practice of itinerant preaching uh, make them more missional than their magisterial counterparts? These are the questions that we seek to answer uh, in the first writing of this chapter or lecture. However, there are edits that we've placed in because the more that I dug, the more that I found that we were mentioned uh, in the writings. Uh, the more I found out uh, that many that were in the writings were humanist or rationist. When you come to these terms, uh, humanist and rationist, you have to examine them. You see, it would be perfectly logical as a student of the Bible for you to potentially begin to want to study oneness believers throughout the centuries. Let me tell you something. You're not going to come up with much. Why? Again, we've been written out of the history books. But when you begin to look at these two primary terminologies, uh, you'll hear about the humanist and the rationist. Uh, and when you read about those, you better give pause for a moment uh, and begin to wonder, what did that humanist believe or what did that rationist mean? Because frequently you'll find out that those two terms that we recoil from today were terms by which and through which anti-Trinitarians were known. A humanist was often an anti-Trinitarian believer. You can say the same of the rationist. Uh, and so you have to understand that when you're doing scholarly research and you're doing a deep dive down into the material that frequently you have got to take and use alternate words uh, or different search terms or when you're reading, be aware that there might be a terminology that you might need to investigate further and see what these actually believed. The early church and mission. As previously noted, all serious study involving the church must consider the history and the practice of the primitive community. Lying beyond the scope of this chapter are the early church's beliefs. However, it is sufficient to say that these place the primitive community at odds with Judaism, uh, religious and governmental authorities, uh, and the prevailing philosophies of the time. The first community was persecuted by the Jews for their beliefs and practices, namely their understanding of the deity of the deity of Christ, baptism and miraculous. Remember, I'm couching this right now because I'm speaking to the evangelical missiological society. The most severe persecution came, however, when Titus besieged Jerusalem from autumn of 66 AD to 70 AD. Although this resulted in a calamity for the Jewish people at large, not just the church. This besiegement and spoiling of Jerusalem resulted in mass dispersion and the spread of the gospel. Let me interject. 
Don't be afraid of persecution. Sometimes it's God's way of unsettling the church uh, to bring about his greater good within the kingdom of God. Sometimes dispersion and migratory patterns are something that God sends to shake the nest of a nation, to get people moving so that the gospel might be advanced. Uh, so the besiegement and the spoiling of Jerusalem resulted in mass dispersion and the spread of the gospel. This reality is elucidated in an article by Christopher Schenk. Uh, Migration and mission, according to the book of Acts, uh, traces for us the contours of mission in instances of forced and uh, voluntary migration. Uh, again, if I could quickly add here, uh, amen, we must be willing to entertain the stranger. A sampling of widespread influence of Anabaptist belief uh, and practice is appreciated uh, in Claus Peter Clanson's uh, statistical survey of the Anabaptist in South and Central Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. Clanson's survey illuminates the migratory patterns of a community of believers besieged by severe persecution as experienced by the primitive church, but growing the kingdom. In the 16th century, the Protestant Reformation brought about seismic changes uh, across the religious and political landscape of Europe. Beginning in 1517, many of the important features of medieval theology were being challenged by Martin Luther, resulting in significant numbers of people rejecting the teachings of the Roman church. Rejection of these beliefs and practices uh, brought about a third branch of Christianity called Protestantism, uh, in addition to Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Schism was not a new thing. Throughout the Middle Ages, a number of individuals and groups uh, had challenged the beliefs and practices of the Roman Catholic Church. Among these were the Waldensians of the 12th century who traced their origins back to the pupils and disciples of the apostles of Jesus Christ. Now again, I want you to take and hold some of what you're, you might be saying about the Waldensians and not taking and placing too much judgment on the things that you've read about them. And the reason why is primarily what's written about the Waldensians uh, is that is, has been written uh, by those that were their detractors and their haters. Let me just add again and, and touch on something your pastor spoke about just a moment ago. I'll deal with it in a little while when I say or when I quote someone by the name of Estep. And he says the medieval era, the medieval time was dark. It was dark. Again, it's hard for us to put ourselves back into that time and understand it. But it was a dark, dark time in the world. There was very, very little value that one placed upon the individual. But what you have to understand is that it was so very dark. But today, I want to talk to this, something that Pastor dealt with. It's still dark, even at the table of the academy. That while I was invited to speak, at the conclusion of this very lecture, minus probably three pages of edits, I was immediately, immediately challenged by someone no further than six feet away who stood up and he told me, he said, I perceive that you are a heretic. And he said, as then all heretics must die. You're a heretic. You must die. 
That is the world and its opinion of many of our beliefs still to this day. I do not want to over-sensationalize. Not everyone is a hater, but there are still people that feel very, very strongly about who we are as a people. Because again, we do not take our cues from the Roman or the magisterial church. We take our cues from the Word of God. God. Uh, amen. So don't let the world be the ones who paint what the Waldensians believe because these were simple people who thought and desired to live out their faith in a very simple way. They simply wanted to take uh, and follow the teachings uh, of the primitive church. Uh, and then we move on to the Albigensians. Uh, Arnold writes of the foment of change in the 12th uh, and the 13th centuries with powerful movements emerging and claiming the title apostolic brothers. Arnold goes on to state these movements were connected with similar trends in the 5th and 6th centuries. Notice we're moving from 12th and 13th back to the 5th and the 6th centuries uh, since at that time the decree, the decree, the degree, uh, was, decree was issued against heretics uh, that point to exactly the same kind of movement. The Albigensians, uh, also known as bonhommes, are bon chrétien, good men, are good Christians, were subsequently rooted out by the Roman Catholic Inquisition as the result of their alleged uh, bringing elements of Persian dualism into their thinking. The Albigensians were accused uh, for believing in two gods because they believed in a force of good in the world, God, and they believed in a force of evil in the world, Satan. So they were considered to be dualist uh, are believing in two gods. Uh, well, I, I believe tonight uh, that there's a God of benevolence, uh, but I also believe that there is an evil in our world today, uh, and that is called Satan. Uh, I'm not going to allow them uh, to take and define who I am and what I believe. Uh, so much of the misrepresenting of what's written in history has been written there, in my opinion, to write us out of the history of Christianity. Devil, you can't, you can't write us out. Uh, devil, you can't write us out. Uh, these, speaking of the Albigensians, these, among many other examples, demonstrate the reoccurring motif uh, among the persecuted of the desire for the purity of Scripture, its teachings, beliefs, and practices in an era of persecution, prosecution, and purification by the threatened established church. While throughout the centuries leading up to the Reformation, there were many groups that sought reforms within the Catholic Church. It was Martin Luther's 95 Theses nailed to the, the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, that became the seminal moment of the Reformation. Luther's voice rises above those of Peter Waldo, John Wycliffe, uh, John Huss. Historically, he is unique as the man who precipitated the break from Rome. However, Luther's call for reform did not go far enough for those who sought a full restoration of the beliefs and practices of the primitive community. The result of Luther's unwillingness to press for greater reforms resulted in discord in the church and persecution of all who opposed him. The heretical beliefs and practices of those he opposed are examined later this evening. Ulrich Zwingli, a contemporary of Luther's, was, prom was a prominent reformer. Zwingli was a Roman Catholic priest influenced by the teachings of the Catholic humanist Erasmus. Notice, notice that word, humanist there. You dig down deep, you're going to find some interesting information embedded within the Catholic tradition. 
Erasmus uh, was one of the few who questioned and reinterpreted some of the medieval doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church uh, without leaving it. Uh, by 1516, Zwingli had already begun to advance the doctrine of salvation through grace alone and within a few months openly criticized the sale of indulgences. The fervor for reformation had so gripped Zwingli, by 1519, he was openly preaching Protestant Protestant themes uh, was Zwingli read and followed the writings and development of Luther's theology. Many of his beliefs were of his own and to a lesser degree the idea of Catholic humanists. As noted by David Bernard, like Luther, however, Zwingli had little use for reformers more radical than himself. Like Luther, Zwingli was willing to persecute radical reformers to the death, even though they had once been numbered among his brightest students, students of Zwingli. These were condemned because they dared to press the boundaries of reform further than Zwingli himself was willing to go. Any discussion concerning the Reformation and mission is not complete without including Jean Calvin or John Calvin. Calvin emerged as one of the most important leaders of the Reformation. Many scholars attribute to him the systematization of the Reformation and bringing together a cohesiveness to biblical doctrine. Hmm. Can I just stop? and tell you something that a professor told me sitting at a Hope University class that I was at on campus when I was doing my master's degree. He said, he looked directly at me and at another apostolic that was sitting in that course, and I had not told anyone who or what I was. And he looked directly at me and he said, you're Pentecostal. And he said, here's what I want you to understand. You are on the fringe. He said, you need to celebrate the fringe that you live on. He said, because the more you take and move towards the center and try to systematize your theology, you will lose your power of experience. He said, hang on to the fringe. It's what gives you the power that you possess. He then called another very prominent Pentecostal group that is not oneness. Uh, and he said they have systematized uh, their theology and in doing so they have lost their power. Uh, amen. Anytime you systematize your theology amen, you find yourself in a place of losing your power power. Uh, we do not want to systematize our theology. It's already been systematized for us uh, in the Word of God. Come on, I said it's already been systematized uh, in the Word of God for us. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Uh, I stand here unabashedly uh, as a non-Trinitarian believer. I stand here as a believer that believes in a systematized theology uh, that Jesus told his disciples to baptize uh, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I believe in a systematization of my theology and that that's exactly what I did. Uh, I got baptized in Jesus' name. Uh, I want to tell you something today. Uh, the only systematization of my theology is the Word Word of God itself. But when you move and you try to systematize your theology, you can be seated uh, according to the systematization uh, of normal or normative theological frameworks. You're in trouble. Jean Calvin or John Calvin. Uh, he is the father of systematized theology, our systematic theology. However, 
he had some detractors. He had some that criticized him. A prominent nemesis of Michael's was Michael Servetus from 1511 to 1553 A.D. He was a Spanish physician, theologian, and humanist. Servetus, as others deemed heretics, was condemned to death by civil and church authorities for not conforming in his writings to the widely accepted doctrine of the Trinity, eternal security, predestination, infant baptism. These placed him at odds with the Reformers and with the Catholic Church. Sir Winston Churchill once said, History is written by the victors. Therefore, comparatively little is known about the real beliefs and practices of those deemed heretics. As previously mentioned, their writings were burned and their voices were silenced. Thus, Wilbert Shank, a professor of your pastor and mine, a leading historian of mission, concludes, virtually all mission history and theology has been presented from the viewpoint of the dominant ecclesiastical tradition. That means, again, our history has not been presented. It's always been one-sided. I thank God for new scholarship. And I'm very heartened that I believe that there is going to emerge a cadre of young scholars within the apostolic movements that are going to go
because what happened before was nothing that we recognize as a baptism at all. There needs to be some absolutes. I'm just going to preach a little bit right now. There need to be some absolutes that you stand up for uh, and that you are absolutely unwavering in. There's got to be some beliefs that you have on the inside of you that says, I'm not for sale. My values aren't for sale. My beliefs are not for sale. Uh, when I'm discussing these things with my friends uh, and with my family at Thanksgiving and Christmas, I'm not going to waffle beneath the heat uh, that they begin to put on me. I'm going to stand up for who I am. I am an apostolic, blood-bought man of God, woman of God, child of God, young person of God. Come on, somewhere there's got to be something that grips a hold of us as a people of God. Summarily, the Zurich Council declared Zwingli the winner and announced the radicals. The radical reformers were left with virtually no options. Conform, denounce your beliefs, leave Zurich, or face imprisonment. Again, there was no tolerance for competing views in the marketplace of Reformation. In the first chapter of R.A. Knox's Enthusiasm, he writes, There is, I would say, a reoccurrent situation in Christianity. Using the word church in the widest sense, where excess of charity threatens unity, you have a clique, an elite of Christian men. I want you to notice, I'm going to call this out for you right now, an elite of Christian men, and more importantly, in parentheses, women who are trying to live a less godly or less worldly life than their neighbors. We're talking about people that wanted to take and live a life that was less worldly than their neighbors who also were called Christians who are trying to live less worldly life than their, their neighbors, uh, to be more attentive to the guidance directly felt, that would tell you of the Holy Ghost. These people are living out their life. They want to live it in a very holy way before God and before man. And they want to have the Holy Spirit leading them and guiding them and directing them is what Knox is saying. Uh, and then he goes on and says, more and more, by a kind of, uh, of, uh, of fatality, you see them draw apart uh, from their co-religionists. They begin to pull back from the Reformed Church. They begin to move away. A hive ready to swarm. There is provocation on both sides between uh, these radical reformers and these, the magisterial reformers. On the one part, there's cheap jokes at the expense of over-godliness. Acts of stupid repression by unsympathetic authorities. On the other, contempt of half-Christian ominous references to old wine and new bottles. To the colonel and the husk. Then while you hold your breath and turn away your eyes in fear, the break comes. Condemnation and secession. What difference does it make? A fresh name has been added to the list of Christianity. End of quote. In reflection, what difference it makes is suppression of another's belief or conviction and schism or division in the body of Christ. This is certainly the tale of those who chose to live out their beliefs uh, in the community uh, of Christ. And a Baptist, as others deemed heretics by the magisterial church, were pioneers of religious freedom. Let me just add, many of the, the things that you take and you tout as American today when it comes to the separation of church and state all are attributed and owing to the Anabaptist tradition. Virtually none of the traditions of the magisterial church have been transferred over. 
It was these uh, who stood that the church uh, should operate and stand autonomously uh, away and outside of the influence of government. Uh, and while we will take and we will uh, appreciate magistrates and their rule over us, we will not let them rule over the things that pertain to God and his house. So, Religious toleration, let alone religious liberty, could not be tolerated in the 16th century. The reformers condemned it as an invitation to social chaos, and political rulers rejected it because it would divide political loyalties. A confluence of political, social, and religious circumstances unique to, the 16th, unique to 16th century Europe is recognized as providing the impetus for a kind of of religious protectionism and voices of dissent and destabilization could not be tolerated by the magisterial church nor the political rulers. The fissure created by this small band of radicals, Conrad Grable, Felix Mons, George Blaurock, cannot be overstated. These reformers insisted on a separation of church and state, repudiated the practice of infant baptism, insisted on believers' baptism of adults only because they felt as though that only an adult could understand why that they were being baptized. They believed that the baptism of a believer was a symbol of the sinking in the death of Christ and being raised again uh, to walk in newness of life according to Romans chapter number six uh, is new life in his resurrection no one can come into the kingdom unless he is born again is what they preached uh, according to John chapter number three and verse number three. They believed you had to be born of the water. And I will tell you that many of them believed, I'll touch on it in a moment, believed that you had to speak in other tongues. I don't know of anything that is more uh, apostolic uh, than baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. That's called an apostolic church. Uh, amen. We're very, we're, 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 we're little, we're very little charity is extended on other reasons or for other reasons. I want to go with that again. Where we take and extend very little charity on other issues. We consider them an apostolic church if they baptize in Jesus' name and are filled with the Holy Ghost. And so... They believe that the new birth was bound up from the same place that you and I take and celebrate when Jesus speaks and, address, and addresses Nicodemus that you must be born of the water and of the spirits. They also believe that perfection, perfection came or is initiated by the receiving of the Holy Ghost working in one's life. Now, I, I want to I just stop again. Uh, everything I'm reading to you, every single bit of it is documented. I believe up in the media room, they have a copy of exactly what I'm reading. They'll see little footnote numbers. And at the bottom... There are my citations. Everything is meticulously detailed and documented. This is not private research. It's academic research. If it's going to be perused and looked at by the academy, it has to stand the scrutiny of the academy. And so when I put in there that these, look at it again, it's when I put in here that these uh, had to be initiated through the Holy Ghost uh, working in their lives, I document that fact. Uh, you need to understand these are all documentable. This is who we are. This is what they were. And while I can't tell you that everyone within the groups that I've mentioned 
person believed everything that I'm saying right now, I can tell you that these Pentecostal impulses and characteristics were in every single one of these groups. Uh, when I speak of the Commissars, when I speak of the Lollards, uh, when I speak of the Albigensians, these were people who were tongue-talking people. The Anabaptists believed, according to George Weitzel, 1501 to 1573, that the true church was the apostolic church. We're not talking about the apostolic see. We're not talking about the Catholic church. We're talking about the apostolic church. He goes on to state, my wish, my yearning is that the word may go back to a true apostolic church. The acts and the writings of the great church fathers and ancient bishops, and we'll have to deal with this, and the ancient bishops show the way on which we must go back to it. The apostolic church flourished to the time of Constantine. To the time. But let's, let's think about to the time of Constantine. From then on, it was perverted because the bishops went over to the world. However, many of the brethren, watch this, however, many of the brethren believed the fall, in quotes, to have precipitate, been precipitated at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. That's when they said the fail came, the fall came. What was that all about? What was that all about? They believe the fall came uh, when the Catholic Church embraced the Trinity. However, many of the brethren believe the fall to have precipitated at the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. with the crystallization, with the crystallization of the Trinitarian formula formula other brothers dated the fall even earlier giving reference to eusebius uh, or eusebius uh, and his attribution uh, and is attributing the fall as taking uh, place uh, upon the death of simeon in 111 a.d they believed in the imminent return of christ their liturgy Watch this, included revivalist symptoms and impulses. They showed, were showed to dance on occasion as the Spirit of God began to move in their midst. They acted like children. And that's always something that I've read all of, I've read a lot of the critiques of this. Uh, they acted like children. Friend, you show up at an apostolic church on a Sunday night. Friend, we're not down on the floor with cars and baby dolls. But friend, I'll tell you what, uh, they might just see a 58-year-old man uh, that's acting a little bit like a child. Uh, these men are not drunk as she supposed. Uh, hey man, these people running these aisles are not drunk. Uh, hey man, they may be acting like kids, but you know what? Uh, what they have a hold of is real. Uh, so what did they do? Uh, they would dance. Uh, they would act like children. Uh, and let me give you the last one. Uh, they would speak in other tongues. Uh, this is what came out of their books. Uh, this didn't come out of what we wrote. This came out of what they wrote. That's why I say you have to dig deep. Uh, and in their criticism of us, you'll find us. Uh, so as they're criticizing us, marginalizing us, trying to detract from who and what we are, they're identifying who we are. And we look back through history and see ourselves. These, as well as those in the first century, these as well as those in the first century are our spiritual 
forebearers. And we must begin to celebrate their history. Uh, I know that I've hit it several times tonight, but I need to do it again uh, this evening. I've watched and read some writings, very brief writings, uh, nothing even as much as I'm presenting here tonight to you, uh, but just, they immediately default uh, to allowing uh, the victors to write our history for us, uh, and they themselves pick up the pen uh, and write negative things about these groups that I've identified when these are our forebears. They may have not always believed everything we believed, but they believe many of the same things that we believed. And I am convinced by my research uh, that many of them believed absolutely everything that we believe. They believe the church was a community of brothers or family. They rejected the medieval church in its entirety. They insisted on following the life pattern of the New Testament. And they established disciplined congregation. It was an insistence on following the Great Commission for all generations. They renounced force and violence, believed in the pursuit of peace, even if it required unjust suffering and persecution, they rejected military service. Has anyone ever read anything about the martyrs of Alcatraz? The martyrs of Alcatraz were two Hutterite brothers that had migrated to the United States. They refused to take up arms in the war. They said, we'll do whatever you need us to do, but we will not bear arms. And the United States government decided that they would press the issue. You have to understand, I'll get to it in just a moment, and I don't want to burden you tonight with too much time. But they had fled to the place that these people that were so ingrained with missional zeal literally only wanted to find a quiet place and live out their faith on some Hutterite commune in North America where no one would bother them. But when the war came, we came asking. But it had long been their tradition to not bear arms and to not wear the uniform, but they would chop wood. They would work in factories they would do whatever they needed to do. But the U.S. government decided they would take these two brothers and they would put them on Alcatraz. And after they got to Alcatraz, where there was no prying eyes and no one to see, there they were killed for their belief. Now I'm going to give you another piece of the history that will make you not very proud of your government, I pray. These men who would never wear a uniform because it detracted from their faith. When the families received the bodies of these noble and pious folk, they opened the casket to see them wearing the uniform. These are persecuted people. It's a sobering thing, especially when you begin to look at their history. They were a people on the run from 1525. And they ran all the way till they came to Moravia, Transylvania, Moravia, and beyond, and finally came to America. These things that I've illustrated in my bulleted listing of their beliefs. 
These were new and radical ideas in the 16th century that challenged the magisterial church and political powers. This fledgling band would not be deterred and therewith, after being condemned by the city council of Zurich, uh, decided that they would no longer theorize uh, what was stated in the scripture, uh, but put it into practice. Uh, therefore, on the night of January 21st, 1525, four days after the third disputation, uh, where these were uh, were considered heretics, uh, named as heretics, uh, and a baptism was born. George Blaurock insisting that Conrad Grable baptize him, and turned George Blaurock baptized Conrad Grable and Felix Mons. Uh, after their own baptism, Grable and Blaurock proceeded to baptize all those that were present. Uh, clearly, these, under penalty of death, sought more than a reformation. They genuinely desired a restoration of the primitive apostolic church. Church historian William Estep writes, uh, this was clearly the most revolutionary act of the Reformation. No other event so completely symbolized the break with Rome, not even Luther's 95 theses on the door of the church at Wittenberg. Uh, here, for the first time in the course of the Reformation, a group of Christians dared to challenge the magisterial emerging church and the Roman Catholic Church and form a church after what was conceived as the New Testament pattern. The rupture did not come solely as the result of believers' baptism, but was also over the Lord's Supper, ecclesial authority, and liturgy. Uh, it was these adherents' uh, insistence on baptism as a visible expression of the church that resulted in the persecution and prosecution. Clearly, insistence on, a, on believers' baptism placed the Anabaptists and these other groups uh, at odds with the Reformers and the Catholic Church. Baptism and community were tenets uh, from which the believers' church, as they were also known, were willing to lay down their lives. William Estep writes, by January 21st, 1525, the concepts both of discipleship and church find implementation in the inauguration of believers' baptism. In the historical process, apparently, both concepts developed simultaneously. Anabaptists sought to return to the pattern of the ethos of the primitive church, they possessed a heightened sense of eschatology. They were anti-intellectual without condemning education. They simply believed that God could speak to simple people as well. They believed in a complete separation of church and government their heightened sense of eschatology was at the heart of Anabaptism's missional impetus of go forth, teach all peoples, and baptize them. Persecution concretized their belief in the imminent return of Christ and hastened their missional endeavors. As axiomatic as it may sound, a spiritually alive community of believers desires to share their faith. This is especially true given the primary, our primacy that Anabaptists gave to the book of Acts. The fervor with which they held to the ethos of the early church, as explicated in Acts 2, 37 through 47, is only mirrored in the primitive church and the modern Pentecostal church today. Uh, the Anabaptist movement of the 16th century were able to achieve what seemed to be impossible for the magisterial reformers. Why? Because C.J. Uh, Dick writes, he says, it is clear that the missionary response for the Anabaptists the primary, was the primary alternative to the methods of the magisterial reformers and that the believer's church was an attractive alternative to corpus Christianum, not to coercion but persuasion, not primary emphasis on reforming society. I want you to get this, not primary emphasis on reforming society, but on establishing a new society. Not individualistic or sacramental salvation, but personal experience and corporate faith were their alternatives. 
The apostolic, the Anabaptist vision was deeply rooted in their desire for the restoration of the primitive apostolic model of the believer church uh, with its implicit theology of discipleship under Christ's lordship and explicit evangelistic witness in the power of the Holy Spirit. This led them to unquestioned obedience to the risen Christ mandate, make disciples of everybody. The radicals were consumed with missionary zeal. The mandate of the Great Commission was the impetus for their intentional missional engagement. Obedience was to obedience to the pursuit of the missional task was tantamount to discipleship and living under Christ's lordship. As such, Anabaptists followed the plan given by Christ in the Great Commission, going into all the world, preaching and teaching the gospel, baptizing adult believers, and incorporating the saved into the church. Five minutes. Okay? Prior to August 1527... The Anabaptists engaged in four specific methods of evangelization, preaching, pilgrims, house meetings, Bibles, reading, and evangelism. But one more, persecution. Persecution as a way of doing mission? Indeed, they embraced persecution. Persecution was perceived as a form of witness to the executioner and to those who come to witness the execution. The serenity with which these lay down their life was nothing short of a call to repentance and reconciliation to God. A great example of such is George Blaurock, uh, one of those three important people we made mention of. He was called Sturdy George. George Blaurock was a powerful preacher. Get this, pastors. He was called the second coming of the Apostle Paul. He was known to get to the magisterial churches before the clerics arrived and preached to hundreds of their congregants and immediately take them to the water and baptize them. Blaurock died a martyr's death. I want you to get this. Blaurock died a martyr's death. You'll see in a chart. Blaurock is attributed to having baptized 4,000 people. However, as the, but Blaurock died a martyr's death. However, as the crowds watched him burn at the stake, a young boy by the name, if you know your history here, of Peter Walpot was so moved by the serenity and the peace of George Blaurock as he burned at the stake that he, upon his own adult baptism, speaking now of Walpot, went on to become the greatest missionary and greatest baptizer of the Anabaptist movement, which means he had to have baptized more than 10,000 people himself. That's the power of a witness. I said, that is the power of a witness. Uh, after the missionary conference in Osborne in uh, 1527, strategic missional methods were initiated and refined. Uh, the Martyr Synod, which is basically considered Osberg Mission Conference, initiated a vision of mission which dealt with delegated uh, areas of mission responsibility. And in a grand map, map of evangelical enterprise, the strategic methods by the believers' church were evangelizing missionaire, systematic sending of missionaries or apostles, that means preachers, an empowering, dynamic lay witness. I'm going to go over this slowly. And then the original business as a mission plan outside of the Apostle Paul. Artisans or artisan evangelists were sent to those with whom they had business dealings 
And the educated were sent to cities where they would reason with the elite in hopes of leading them to Christ. Uh, these did whatever they had to do and were intentional about their mission. Let me just say this. They literally turned Europe upside down. Uh, friend, if three men, it ignited with three men, if those three men can ignite such a passion in the face of such persecution, what is the excuse of the church today? Uh, or maybe it's not, it's that we are not releasing our people into the mission field. Uh, they took and sent the professional clerics. Uh, they sent uh, lay missionaries. They sent artisan, artisan missionaries or business people. They sent those that were part of the academy to speak to the academy. They were intentional about doing mission. Hence, how effective and far-reaching were the missionary efforts of the Anabaptist movement and these other groups? Admittedly, few extant records are available that chronicle the measurable numerical, uh, numerical impact of the movement, although a small glimpse is provided by Hans Kostorf. I believe it's on a slide. In a chapter of Anabaptist approach to mission, he documents the missional endeavors of just 17 of just 17 missionaries, too small for you to read, of just 17 missionaries. This is just, this is just 17 missionaries right here. Now remember, they're sending everybody. Everyone's considered a missionary. But we have very few extant records. There's, there's just not that many records that we can put our hands on. These are 17. He documents their ministry. Sometimes their ministry were just for a day or two. Sometimes they were weeks, months, and the largest, the biggest one, the one who took and ministered the longest was for 31 years. And he, speaking of Leonard Bowens, he baptized 10,378 souls. Uh, Three, uh, 10,378 souls. And Peter Walpott uh, baptized more than him. Uh, Kosdorf asserts uh, the cost of obedience to the Great Commission was very high. It is estimated that four to 5,000 Anabaptists may have been martyred for, the, their, for, for their commitment to the early church's beliefs and piety. However, extant records uh, show that there were more than 2,000 of these noble folk that were killed. Uh, they were burned alive. They were killed with a sword. And the favorite way that the magisterial church killed them was through a means of, you want to be baptized? We will baptize you. And they would take them in large numbers to a bridge, and they would bind them hand and foot adult and children alike, and throw them into the frigid waters. And these would never open their mouth except to give witness or worship God. Numerous scholars or scholarly works chronicle the reach of the Anabaptist movement, be they as intentional sending or believer's church in flight from severe persecution Within 25 years of the initiation of the Believer's Church, Anabaptist missionaries were preaching in every corner. There's a map up there. It's not very clear. They were preaching in every corner of Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Holland, France, Poland, Galicia, Hungary, Denmark, Sweden, Greece, Constantinople. And these, under persecution, even pondered going, in quotes, going to the Red Indians across the sea. The Hutterian golden era under the capable 
leadership of Peter Walpott was marked with pronounced emphasis on mission. As other Anabaptists preceded him, uh, the Hutterites carried the gospel to the four corners of Europe. Southern German Baptists began, uh, Anabaptists began their migration eastward towards Moravia as early as 1526. Uh, and by 1546, they continued eastward uh, in their migration to Slovakia. The Hutterite migration resumed in 1621, established several brethren colonies uh, in Transylvania, and the Hutterite migration continued into the 19th century with many migrating to the United States between the years of 1820. 1874 and 1879. As with all Anabaptists, the Hutterites were compelled to take the gospel to those who the magisterial church uh, had neglected. Uh, later, Anabaptists moved from evangelism to seeking toleration in the face of extraordinary host hostility. These sought a place of quiet, or a place to quietly practice their faith within isolated communities. But I want you to know something. Every time that you go by one of these places today, no, if you'll actually look, and I could trace it out in history, that many of them were reintroduced to many of the teachings of the Catholic Church, especially as they moved to Transylvania. But when you literally have been chased all over Europe for 300 years, all you want is to find a quiet little place in the world. You've lost your missional impetus. I said, they lost their missional impetus. Can I just trace that out a little bit for you and I today? Sometimes when we've been in church a few years, we lose our missionary zeal. A good friend of mine wrote a book called Sectarian Cycle. His name's Dan Butler. And Brother Butler Potts, it's in that book. He says, you know what? For the most part, everyone has to have a first-generation experience. And the reason why, if they don't have a first-generation experience, he says, they will lose their missionary zeal and a church will not continue to grow. So as a result, another thing you can get out of what I'm saying tonight is that mission must be at the core or at the heart of who we are as a people. From our vantage point, it's unimaginable how these pious believers could embrace such a severe persecution and death as a means of giving witness to, to Christ uh, and extending his mission. However, this was the plight that they embraced. Uh, Hans Kosdorf asserts that the persecution was uh, so severe that only two or three of the 60 leaders who met in Osberg uh, in 1525 were alive to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Anabaptist movement. Thousands of men, women, and children were martyred for their faith. These noble and pious witnesses of the faith were tortured, burned, beheaded, drowned, hanged for little more than desiring to pursue what you and I have here tonight. Uh, Acts 2. Their willingness to suffer rather than recant or deny their faith demonstrates conviction of belief under the threat of death. Uh, they were consumed with go and make disciples and baptize them. Uh, with this in mind, there were several lessons to be learned. First of all, that we can take to heart tonight is that they were radically, I want to use the word, they were radically missional. The church must be radically missional. You have to be sold out to the mission of God. Come on, I say, you got to be sold out to the mission of God. The reason why I believe that they were so powerful in their witness uh, is because of Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 8. But you shall receive power after the, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then you're going to be a witness here uh, and here uh, and here. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the, the uttermost part. Uh, come on, you're going to be a witness uh, there's got to be a priority of mission. Mission's got to be a priority. It's not a secondary thing. Come on. It's got to be a priority. They understood mission always implies. I want you to get this. They, they, they understood mission always implies crossing frontiers from faith to unfaith. To faith to unfaith. No matter what the price they believed in the legitimacy of the apostolate, and they believed in living witnesses. Uh, they believed 
This is documented. They believe that believers are empowered by the Holy Ghost as witnesses and to do so by telling, being, doing, and even dying for their faith. A host of noble and pious heretics were persecuted for their beliefs and practices. The historical record clearly demonstrates how these religious minorities were persecuted for practicing believers' baptism, spontaneous emotional outbursts, uh, prophetic utterances of tongues, uh, the practice of speaking in tongues. They distinguish between the two. No matter what the condemnation, ridicule, or persecution by the magisterial church or the Catholic church, uh, they persevered in spreading the gospel. Indeed, these were groups that engaged in mission on the margins from the fringes of the Reformation. As posited by Franklin H. Littell, the Anabaptists proper were those in the left wing, who gathered and disciplined a true church upon the apostolic pattern and envisioned an alternative social order. The Anabaptists and other groups, to lesser extent, pursued the apostolic mandates given by Christ. Go, make disciples, baptize, teach. It always comes up again and again. Undoubtedly, the impetus... An understanding of mission of the Anabaptist movement far exceeded that of the magisterial church in all its forms today. The history of the Reformation was written by the victors. However, 500 years later, fresh insights are emerging of a missional movement that continues to inform mission praxis in the 21st century. The apostolic church is a growing force. Pentecostalism uh, is the fastest growing uh, form of Christianity in the world. You need to lift your hands and celebrate your part of history. Your part of not just the early church, but the church throughout history. God bless you tonight.